Welcome to Been There, Done That, practical tips for processing and managing inventory. It's an honor to share with you today. I'm Anna Packer, and I've been selling on eBay for about five years. I started part-time in 2017, and I went full-time in 2019, actually three years ago this week. My inventory began with a few items from around my house, and I ran the whole store out of my garage at first. But since then, it's grown from one single item to over 12,000 active listings. I've actually listed over 20,000 items over the lifetime of my store, but I'm happy to report that several thousand of them have sold. <laughs> so I never imagined my store would get this big, but I can tell you that dealing with inventory has been a challenge the whole time. I have learned a lot from other sellers and that saved me from reinventing many wheels. So in that same spirit, I wanna share with you what's worked for me. Fortunately for me, I love this topic and I could talk about it all day. Fortunately for you, I only have 30 minutes, so let's go. I'm going to throw a lot of information your way, but I want you to know that everything I'm sharing with you is tried and true in my own store. So listen closely for just one simple thing you can apply this week in your store. We're going to cover tools and rules, death pile tactics, and creating a system. Let's start really concrete with tools. By tools, I mean the actual items I use to keep my inventory managed well. Everything from storage bins to Sharpies count as tools. The real heroes here are the things that help me to physically structure and maximize my storage space. Long ago, I outgrew the garage and I now have three storage units of about 275 square feet in total for my inventory. So most of the tools I'm gonna mention stay in those storage areas with my inventory for easy access. Every tool contributes to a simple, clear experience working with my inventory from sourcing to shipping. And speaking of clear, I mean that literally. When I started, I was so scrappy and I used whatever I could find, cardboard boxes, beat up old bins with no lids, and even bags. But once my inventory was in the several thousands, I was spending a lot more time looking for stuff when it sold. And by spending time, I mean wasting time. And that's where the clear part comes in. I know this may be shocking, but storing items in clear bins makes an item way easier to spot even before I take the lid off. So eventually, I replaced all my scrappy stuff with clear lidded plastic bins, and I can tell you it's a real time saver, especially with a large inventory. I use three different sizes of bins, 56 quarts, 28 quarts, and 16 quarts. They're uniform, durable, and fairly cheap and they really fit very nicely onto my next favorite tool, which is steel shelving. These are sturdy, efficient, and the shelf height is adjustable. Shelves like these, when you can find them for a reasonable price, are totally worth it to maximize your storage space, whether in your home or in storage units like I have. Maximizing space is so important either way. So shelving like this on casters is ideal, so I can move them around as needed whenever it's time to pull items for shipping. I buy them in three feet wide and five foot wide varieties. So with casters on them, I can fit about nine into one of my 10 by 10 storage units, just to give you an idea. So let me show you one of them. This is my first storage unit. And as you can see, I stack the bins to the ceiling, hence the green ladder. Don't worry, the items on the top are lightweight. Um, so you can see the bins and shelves that I mentioned, and those are kind of the rule, but there are exceptions, like the big purple bin you see on the floor is actually full of extra large stuffed animals. And I've got a couple of bookshelves where I file books away like library style. And there are also some large or oddly shaped items that are just loose on the shelves that don't fit neatly into a bin. So the last of my top three favorite tools is a rolling caddy like this and it holds all of my other assorted tools. I keep one in my storage unit and I have a similar one at my shipping station at home. I keep everything in here from bottled water to tape, to labels, Sharpies, tape measure, scissors, anything you can think of. Um, anything I might need while I'm adding new inventory or pulling inventory that's sold from my storage. So, clear bins with lids, steel shelving, preferably on casters, and this rolling type of catch-all caddy are really the backbones of my storage situation. 
but there are a couple of other honorable mentions on my list of tools that I want to tell you about. The first is a step ladder. As you saw, I stacked my bins to the ceiling, and as it turns out, I am not nine feet tall. So a step ladder is pretty much a necessity if you're really trying to max out your space. I also really like squishable laundry totes. Those are kind of my go-to container for pulling any items that aren't fragile from my inventory for shipping. And then I just use a clear bin like what I use for storage to transport items that are fragile. I also use a flat cart that's in my storage building really frequently, but if that wasn't an option, I would get a collapsible wagon in order to transport my sold items from inventory storage to my car to my shipping station. And finally, micro organizers are great for tiny items like matchbooks or lapel pins. So think about things like a tackle box or a jewelry case. For example, I have about 1,500 lapel pins listed in my store right now, and I keep them all in one little box with many compartments, and I sort them by color. So that's it for my favorite tools. Now let's talk rules. <sighs> okay, rules. So listen, I'm all about flexibility. That is one of the main reasons I started selling on eBay in the first place. However, having some general guidelines for managing your space and your stuff can help keep things really simple so that you can spend more time sourcing, shipping, or sipping something out of a coconut on a beach hundreds of miles away from your inventory. I know that all sounds nice to us from time to time, right? So you heard me. The first rule is to stay away. Stay away from your stuff. <laughs> keep it out of your living space whenever possible. If not in separate buildings, then in separate rooms. If not in separate rooms, then at least in separate sections. Keep your shipping station separate from your own stuff too. It cuts down on chaos, clutter, and overwhelm in your personal space. That rule has been very important in my own household. It is a trade-off because having everything on hand with me at my home in my garage was really simple and easy for pulling inventory versus having it in a storage facility that requires a lot of loading and unloading and you know transporting items. I also have to pay for that storage, but currently, the latter is really what works best for me. So I really wanna invite you to think about what's gonna work best for you. Okay, the next rule is about listed items versus unlisted items. And the rule basically is never the twain shall meet. So new store, uh, never store new inventory items that are unlisted among the already listed items. I want you to think of them as oil and water. That helps avoid confusion, and it also helps you get a good visual sense of how much stuff you have listed, and maybe more importantly, how much stuff you have not yet listed. <laughs> but we're gonna get to that. In other words, it's difficult to grasp the magnitude of a death pile if it's all tucked into the nooks and crannies among your listed inventory. So the next rule we need to talk about is having a tidy table. I would encourage you to keep a tidy table by having only a very limited selection of your most frequently used items at hand and let all of the other less often used things reside in something that's out of sight but still readily accessible, not cluttering your physical space or your visual space. That one's pretty simple. And now we're moving on to love to label. That's another rule that I live by, which means I label every bin. I like to keep it really simple and use numbers. I know it's so original, but honestly with around 450 bins, this makes it really easy for me to find stuff spanning across three different storage units. I know also that when I love to label, I can easily update my inventory records when I need to. And really whether you have a large inventory or a small one, labeling will help you keep your head on straight. Also, if you have or you want to have a large inventory, don't store similar items together with no bin labels. It's easier to spot the thing you're looking for among a bunch of other things that don't look almost exactly like it. And I am certainly the cautionary tale here. When I started out, I would group similar items together back in the garage days. But once I hit about 5,000 items, I wish I'd just numbered all of my bins from the beginning. So if you can, don't make my mistakes and just remember that it's never too early or too late to label. Okay, so the next rule is about those items that are unbinnable, those things that are exceptionally fragile, extra large, or otherwise difficult. And I would really encourage you to consider pre-packing those items for shipping as soon as they're listed. But be sure that when you do that, you label the box. 
So you're not labeling a bin in this case, but you're labeling the box. And for a smaller inventory, you might even consider doing that for all of your items. My husband actually has a store that supports his collecting habit, and he does this for all of his items. Every single time he lists something, he packs it up for shipping right then and there. But for me, it doesn't really work because I have such a large inventory and I'm listing so many things every month, it just wouldn't be practical. But I do use this as a way to protect those items that really won't fit in a bin very well. Okay, and this is probably the most important thing uh, about rules, and this is the rule of living by a spreadsheet. And I really love to maintain a simple spreadsheet. I'm not talking about formulas, I'm talking more or less about a log, okay? A log of information about your items because what the pages hold, my brain doesn't have to, <laughs> which is great. So storing and organizing your information about each item um, before and after and throughout its whole life cycle on eBay is really crucial. So here's a look at my inventory log. You might notice that some of the things I like to log are item number, storage unit number, bin number, the listing title, category, source, the cost of goods, meaning what I paid for that item, and the list price. Red is actively uh, listed and for sale, and the green ones have already sold. So I just wanna show you this as an example before we get into the next section. So, have you already found one simple thing to try? If you have, great. But if you haven't, buckle up because we're about to tackle our collective nemesis, the death pile. Now, imagine a growing collection of unprocessed, unlisted inventory. You know the one I mean, the pile. Envision it in all its glory, or if it's nearby, take a good look at it, but don't make any sudden movements. Whether present or imagined, I want you to look at that death pile straight in the eye and whisper, you are finite. I'm half kidding, but only half. So if you're fortunate enough not to suffer from any death piles, good for you, but humble yourself. You still have a role to play. Preventing death piles is actually simple, but prevention takes intention. You have to be proactive about it. Now, I'm not sure exactly when a collection of new inventory technically becomes a death pile, but we all know in our gut when it does, right? Well, here's my hot take. Don't source if you already have a bunch of things to list. I said it was simple, not easy. After all, sourcing is fun, as we all know. And yet, I've been known to enact a sourcing ban for myself for weeks at a time if needed, and I know that sounds terrible. <laughs> and yes, I realize that there's an opportunity cost here. Some of the items I might find if I were outsourcing would be valuable, but so is my sanity, and so is the sustainability of my store, and so are yours. So the next time you feel like you're missing out on good stuff by taking a break from sourcing, just remember that death pile prevention means staying sane and staying sustainable. So now that we know how to be proactive, let's get to the nitty gritty of reactive tactics. When it comes to the death piles that do exist, many of us need to focus on conquering. And conquering is just anything you do that actually deals with the death pile that's already accumulated in that closet or garage or dark forsaken corner of your basement. But the first thing that we really have to do or that I would recommend that we do is to evaluate the items in the pile. And in most cases, this means re-evaluating these items. So that can be pretty taxing, it can be pretty intimidating because of decision fatigue. So it really helps to have specific criteria that will help you decide what's worth listing and what's not. And it's okay to change your mind about an item. So specific criteria might include the relative value of the item, your own personal interest in that item, or the amount of effort it would take to get that item into sellable condition. But I wanna encourage you that the use of criteria is more important than exactly what the nature of that criteria is. So for example, maybe you don't wanna deal with items under $20. Maybe you don't wanna deal with items that are outside the scope of your expertise or your interest, or items that require a lot of elbow grease and time to restore or repair. Does any of that sound familiar? I found that most of the things that end up in our death piles are things like that. So consider this your official permission slip to release an item like that back into the wild 
or even gift it to someone else who would appreciate it. Specific criteria will help you to decide what to dump, and it can help you find the will to list. So you might list the five or 10 most interesting things from the pile, or the five or 10 most valuable things from the pile. You might pick things that are all the same color, or pick things that remind you the most of your dad, or pick things that remind you the least of your dad. Whatever, but whatever you choose, just find something that's compelling to you. Could even be silly, but some criteria and have a little fun whittling down your death pile by actually listing, because even a little bit of progress is vastly superior to dreading your work. So when you find your will to list, set a doable listing goal, and that could look different for everybody. It could be one item today, it could be one item for the week. It could be 20 items for today or 20 items for the week. Whatever it is for you, schedule it in increments because progress is not all or nothing. Destroy that pile one chunk at a time and reward yourself as you go. All right, so that is in a nutshell how we can use listing to move our death pile along, but listing can be tedious as we know, and sometimes it really does call for a fresh approach. So however you usually process items, try the opposite. I like to think of this as zooming in or zooming out. So zooming in might look like grabbing one item from your pile, logging it, cleaning it up, creating a title, taking photos, creating a draft, pricing it, listing it. Now it's one down, many more to go, and maybe you've only made a little bit of progress, but that item's completely done. The only thing left it has to do is sell. On the other hand, zooming out might look like cleaning a whole bunch of items up at once and then logging them all at once and then organizing them into storage bins efficiently. And maybe, for example, that's all you could get done in one day. And after that, you don't have anything listed, but you do have something that looks and feels far less like a death pile and far more like a tidy inventory queue. Now it's clean, counted, double checked for flaws, full of potential and ready to be photographed. So think for yourself, would you prefer to zoom in or zoom out? Do you already tend to zoom in or zoom out? And would you be open to trying the opposite? Lately, I've found that zooming out and batch processing is much easier for me to then grab a bin and get it listed myself or to hand over to my helpers. That's right, helpers. With no more death files to keep you company, you might need to hire a helper or two or 20 at some point. Currently, I have three helpers who work various part-time amounts for me each week based on their av availability and what they do. So I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to one of them. This is Amanda. She is one of my best friends, my sister-in-law, and a hard-working powerhouse in my eBay store. Every month, Amanda processes hundreds of items, cleaning them up, logging, researching, photographing them, before she then hands them back over to me to officially get them listed and stowed away until they sell. And she even helps me source sometimes. To be honest, Amanda deserves way more than one slide because aside from being generally awesome, my store has absolutely exploded in growth since I hired her to help me part-time. And it really has been a huge win-win for us. Her wins include having interesting, flexible work she can do from home, and that allows her to spend more time with my adorable niece you also see in this picture. And my wins include getting to meet up with her, my bestie, to eat falafel and swap bins every couple of weeks. And of course, the aforementioned explosive growth. Let me tell you a little bit more about that part. So when Amanda came on in mid-2020, I had about 6,000 active listings. And as of mid-2022, the size of my inventory has more than doubled. Like I said earlier, currently hanging out above 12,000 items. And there's just no possible way that I could have added that much value to my store without Amanda's tireless work and passion for growing the store with me. And before you ask, no, you cannot have Amanda. Sorry, not sorry. Now, I realize that not everybody has a large inventory business model like mine, but for many other reasons, you know, not everybody wants or needs a helper. But if you're dealing with death piles, you're dealing with burnout, you have big growth goals or all of the above, employing even one helper part-time can radically improve your power to conquer all of those. Are you still working on figuring out your one simple thing to try? Let's talk systems. Okay, 
Let me state for the record that I am not, I repeat, I am not trying to force feed anybody my own system. However, the single most salient piece of advice I could give you is to create a system for how you run your store, especially in the inventory department. Some people hear the word system and they instantly recoil. And if that's you, I totally get it, but there are some compelling reasons why you should consider creating a system that works for you anyway. As it turns out, a death pile is not a system. And the good news is your system doesn't have to be complicated and actually it really should be simple. One of the biggest benefits of having a system is the built-in consistency in your business. And I'm talking about your own experience running your store and your buyer's experiences interacting with your store. Closely related to consistency is predictability, both within your own workflow and in being able to estimate the amount of time it's going to take you or a helper to complete the work in a given day or week. And another big one is clarity, which makes it easier to prioritize your tasks and preserves your focus so you can bring your sharpest self to every phase in the life cycle of your store, not to mention the whole life that you live outside of running your eBay store. A system also protects you against blunders and time suckers like looking for misplaced items, refunding items found damaged in storage, and things like that. And all of that adds up to efficiency. So you're saving time, money, and energy among other resources. Having a system can preserve virtually any resource you use to run your store, making the most of all of them so that you don't needlessly squander your youth or your profits on inventory management. Of course, I want your system to work for you, but a good system is also replicable, which means someone else could take over the process for you if you were not available for some reason, or if you wanted to hire out some of your work tasks at some point. As a very specific example, I'm going to show you two crucial segments of the system that I created for my store of 12,000 very miscellaneous items. So let's talk a little bit about what happens before the sale. I will go sourcing, I'll bring a haul of items into my living room to batch process, and I make sure they're out of my living space by the end of the business day because my first rule is to stay away. And so I will clean them, I will log them and organize them. And then next, those items will be photographed, placed back into their bins that already have numbers on them, listed, filed onto one of those steel shelves, and finally, they'll wait patiently and securely to be sold. I've really found that when I'm clear on my process, it's easier for me to say yes to the next step and to prevent bottlenecks in my own workflow. The other segment I wanna to talk to you about is after the sale. So here's what happens once an item sells from my store. A few times a week, I'll compile a pull list from my inventory spreadsheet. I have a page that's all just the items that have sold, where I've copied and pasted that same string of data you saw earlier. And I will show you an example of what that looks like. So as you can see, the data on this page includes the storage unit number, the bin number, and the item title, among other things. I sort this list by the storage unit and ascending bin numbers, and I take a screenshot on my phone. And there's my list. And I really can't stress how fast this makes pulling hundreds of items to ship every month. Periodically, I will have to do some maintenance on my inventory too. So this isn't a specific segment, but this is just sort of rolling along with the whole process of my store. I have to go in and manage this inventory to make the most of the space that I have. So I might find a couple of bins that are half empty or half full where my optimist at. But in any case, I'll find them and I'll consolidate them, combining their contents into one bin. And having that spreadsheet makes a consolidation like that really easy because I can then just find and replace uh, the bin numbers in the spreadsheet to locate and update all of the listings that were affected by that. And so that allows me to free up the precious real estate on the shelves for all the new items that are coming into my store every month. I want you to remember that no system is perfect. So if something doesn't neatly fit into your system every once in a while, it's okay. That wonky instance is the exception rather than the rule. And in the meantime, your sanity and your sustainability still get to remain intact. I wanna leave you with a few final encouragements, some key takeaways for you. And the first one is to start where you are and use what you have. It's okay to be scrappy now and upgrade as you go. It really does pay to have a clear, simple inventory system. Even if you start today, 
your future self will thank you for not waiting any longer. I also want to encourage you to do plenty of experiments early and often. There's no need to do them all at once, but I do encourage you to put in the time to find out what really does work for you. Listed is always better than piled. So remember, you don't have to figure it all out before you start implementing your system. I know your death pile is already dwindling, and I promise you it really is finite. Getting things listed a bin at a time or even an item at a time counts as true measurable progress. So give yourself credit for that and let that motivate you to forge ahead and keep on growing. Hopefully by now you've identified one simple thing to try out. So I want you to try it with gusto. Your store and your sanity will thank you in unison. Thank you so much for your time today. It's really been a blast sharing with you and I hope you've had at least as much fun as I have. Feel free to take what you like and leave the rest. Just don't add it to the pile. So thank you so much for your attention. Godspeed and good luck with your inventory.